unseen enemy or battling an invisible enemy. Same thing. It's unseen. It's undetected. It's on surfaces. It's in the air. It's in healthy people. It's in friends. We, we're not suspecting it. We don't notice it. We're not looking for it. And if we were, we can't see it anyway until it attacks. It may be so unnoticed, but yet so powerful. The weapons that we use, cleanliness, sanitizing, distance, masks, our strategy, avoid contact, avoid ingesting. It uses our own cells against us, it uses our own bodies to attack us. I bet you thought I'm talking about the virus, right? I'm not. Oh, sounds like the virus? Yeah. This is an invisible spiritual enemy that virtually mirrors the viral enemy. Do you realize that? It's virtually the same tactics, the same thing. Let's look at it in the Word of God. One of the things that we do to combat this enemy is to wash our hands. I'm going to look at Mark chapter, uh, no, first, let's go to Psalm 24. We wash our hands, right? We're told to wash our hands regularly, uh, soap and water, 20 seconds, in between the fingers, on top, on the bottom, everywhere, after we've touched anything, after we've touched anybody, wash your hands, don't touch your face, don't touch your mouth, all that stuff. Look at the word of God in Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. No, just because we wash our hands with soap and water doesn't mean we're going to come into the presence of God. Clean spiritual hands. But virtually the same thing. He goes on to say, Who has not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God, from the God of his salvation. Clean hands. We don't put our hands to iniquity. We don't use our hands for evil things. We use our hands for the things of God. Our hands can just as easily hold the Bible as it could hold some smutty novel or some pornographic literature. Our hands can just as easily hold a small Bible as it can hold a remote for TV or pay-per-view. Clean hands. Hands that are lifted before the Lord in worship and in praise. Lifting holy hands without wrath or doubting. Spending time worshiping God, not avoiding God. Right? As soon as Adam and Eve fell into sin, the first thing they did was avoid God. They wanted to avoid Him. They, wanted to keep, they didn't want to be in His presence. They were afraid of Him. We can either use our hands to bring us into the presence of God through worship, or we can use our hands to take us away from the presence of God through fear. Clean hands. The next thing we see, sanitizing surfaces. Sanitizing surfaces. Now we'll go to Matthew. Uh, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 7. Go to Mark chapter 7. We know that uh, the virus can survive, you know, a certain number of hours on this service, certain number of hours on that service, and so we sanitize everything. We're sanitizing all the seats, all the pews, sanitizing the doorknobs here at the church, sanitizing all the counters, everything sanitizing. Chapter 7, verse 1, Mark 7. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes who came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, in other words, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, they don't eat holding the tradition of the elders. And this is not just washing dirt off the hands. This is a ritual cleansing. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things which they've received to hold as the washing of cups, pots, brazen vessels, and tables. They're washing surfaces. Now, Jesus points out that they are doing that for a ritual purpose. And it's one thing to have this ritual purpose and it's another thing 
to be personally cleansed. We can either be ritually clean or personally clean. Now today, uh, to give you an example today, there are probably a number of different Christian uh, denominations that are ritually clean. They go through all the motions. They go through everything that their religion tells them, but yet they don't know the presence of God, nor have they been washed by the blood of the Lamb being born again. So they're ritually clean, but not personally clean. We need to avoid this because if we want to combat this unseen enemy ritual cleanliness is not going to cut it yes sanitize but we need to sanitize in the spirit too sanitizing ourselves by the spirit of god not just ritually cleaning everything around us but sanitizing ourselves by the presence of god now it has formerly been called social distancing. I'm renaming it physical distancing because it has nothing to do with social. If you're there in the same room, then it's a physical distancing, right? It's not so, you're social already, you're together. So it's physical distancing. And physical dis distancing um, keeps things from spreading, the unseen enemy from spreading one to another. Physical distancing, six feet apart, every other seat when we come to the sanctuary. The enemy would try to keep us physically apart, try to keep us socially apart, and try to keep us spiritually apart. What he wants to do primarily is keep us apart from God, keep us away from God, cause us to turn away from God in fear or in shame, that we don't turn to the fullness of the Lord and receive everything he has for us. As I mentioned, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they ran from God, and the Lord could not let them remain in the garden. So. Through the blood of the Lamb, through the Lord Jesus, we can come back into the presence of God. And through his name, we have access to the very throne of grace. Grace is what comes upon us when we are forgiven. Grace is why we're forgiven. Grace allows us to be grafted into the root of Israel. Grace allows us to have the promises of God when we don't deserve it, but Jesus took the punishment. That's grace. Grace is allowing his sacrifice to count for us. And his presence, he wants us in his presence. He wants us, like Moses said, show me your glory. He wants to show us his glory. So, next, the air, sanitizing the air. Isn't that, that's the main concern. People wear masks to try to sanitize the air. The idea, if you have a mask on, if you have any sickness, when you sneeze or when you cough, it spreads it into the air. So we wear a mask so it doesn't spread into the air. So technically that's trying to sanitize the air. I'm absolutely sure there are going to be a number of um, air conditioning companies and um, air filtration companies that will have new things that sanitize the air in your homes so that, and offices. It's probably gonna be a huge business in the next two years. There's another one of those businesses you wanna get into, air sanitizing. Um, because remember, there were diseases in the past, like Legionnaire's disease. People caught that through the air, through the air conditioning systems. So, pardon? Yeah, pure, air purification, air sanitizing. So that's going to be real big in the coming days. So that's, that's an attempt to sanitize the air. Let's look at this from Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. We'll start in verse 1. And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins where in times past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. There it is. The prince of the power of the air. We need to sanitize the air from the enemy. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. We need some spiritual air sanitizers. You know, I, I, I thought of something the other day, and actually I didn't think I'd have a time to share it, but... It just came back to me this moment, talking about air sanitizers. Um, there was an evangelist that Pastor Mary Beth and I knew years and years ago, and he was, uh, he had a, a, a different kind of sense of humor, but he was also very blunt and very direct. And um, he was in a big church one day, and he went into the restroom. He was preaching, and he went into the restroom after the service, and there was somebody smoking, you know, somebody who was a member of that church smoking in the restroom. And he just washed his hands, and he's, as he's washing his hands, he takes a deep breath, and he says, ah, the only place I don't mind the smell of smoke. 
Now, you got to think about that for a minute to say what he was saying, but he was very blunt. Air sanitizer. That's a place you want air sanitizer. Uh, we need to sanitize the spiritual atmosphere because the prince of the power of the air hangs out. Unseen, invisible, but deadly. Unseen, invisible, but powerful. Not as powerful as the Lord our God, as we're going to see in a few moments. But I, I just could not help understanding how similar it is with the unseen enemy of the virus and the unseen enemy of the spirit of darkness. So, so, so very similar. So let's get on to how we can combat this, okay? Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we are going to look at verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Well, I... I this has nothing to do with the teaching, but I thought I'd just take a moment here. Any of you who are um, not allowed out, you've been sleeping more, sleeping in in the morning, sleeping, you know, it's just sleeping more. I, I was talking to a neighbor the other day, and um, I said, hey, how are things, how's everything going? And they said, oh, we're just bored out of our minds. And I'm thinking, really? I, I still don't have a spare moment. I, I like, every minute is busy. And... Um, I started to think about that, that there are people that are still locked away in their homes and they're deemed non-essential, non-essential. Think about that for a moment. Are any one of us non-essential? Who has a right to say who's essential and who's not essential? Do you ever feel like you're non-essential to the church? There are no non-essential people in the body of Christ. Regardless of what state we abide in, there are no non-essential people in the body of Christ because if you take this out to its logical extension, the church is non-essential because we're not listed as an essential business that we could freely meet. What government can tell the church it's non-essential? And yes, I know, we're talking about for our own good, absolutely. And that's why from the very, very beginning, before any order was given, if you remember back in the beginning of March, I told you we're gonna go online and we're gonna have service online. It does not diminish the anointing in any way. It does not diminish the church in any way. But there are churches that were unable to, to go online. Does that mean they're non-essential? No. There is no person in our nation that is non-essential, regardless of their business. Because I pointed this out before, and, I, and I'll point it out again. The people who are deeming others non-essential are being paid. They're the ones that are being paid. They're the ones that are employed. Even if, they're not at, even if they're at home, they're being paid. No non-essentials in the body of Christ. Every one of us is equipped for this battle. Every one of us is needed for this battle against the powers of darkness. So let's not sleep. Let's watch and be sober. Now this word sober, I'm going to look at in a couple of scriptures. Let's watch and be sober. Not because I think anybody's drinking when you're at home during the stay at home. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. There it is again, sober. Let's just talk a minute about being sober. That literally it has the literal meaning of not drinking alcohol. But it also has the meaning of being observant. Because when someone is drunken, they're not observant. That's why they have accidents and things. It also means to be watchful. We're told to watch and pray. It also, it means to be vigilant. We are on guard. We are watching. We are aware of the enemy. We are not aware of his devices. We know how he acts. We know what he does. We have it written in the word of God. And he, he's not original. He does the same thing over and over because it works. 
so we recognize it and stop reacting to it. We are attentive, <coughs> excuse me, attentive, attentive. Attentive means we are at attention. We're not just hanging out doing nothing. We are at attention, we are observing, we're alert, we're watching, we're praying, and we're heeding, we're heeding the word of God or any danger signals that we see. You know, if you think about the enemy in the garden, he raised his profile by taking power over other people. He raised his profile. He became important by taking power over others. How did he do that? Persuading them. Persuading them to do something that was not good for them. When I mentioned about the virus, the virus doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything by itself. The virus can't do anything other than enter our cells and make our cells produce more virus. It hijacks our cells. That's what the enemy does. He hijacks our mind. He hijacks our will. Sometimes hijacks our bodies in order to do what he wants or in order to replicate or duplicate the works of darkness. But we fight against that. Here he says, but let us who are of the day be sober. So the first thing is we are watchful, we are observant. We're not going to be asleep at the wheel, <clears throat> right? Putting on the breastplate of faith. Putting on the breastplate of faith. There we go. Breastplate of faith. So much, as many times when we're praying for people during this, these viral days, I'm praying about the shield of faith because the shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. So I'm praying that this shield of faith, that we are extending our faith around ourselves and around our loved ones, that no fiery darts, none of the viral particles can get through that shield of faith. They die on contact. They stop or they're dismantled or they break apart. They cannot attach, in other words. You know, if there's a dart coming, a dart meaning an arrow or something, and there's no shield, <clears throat> it attaches to a person. It enters them. But if the shield, the shield stops it. And our shield of faith stops all the fiery darts of the viral wickedness of the enemy. So it cannot attach. You think about the virus, anybody who's, who's read about it, it, once it comes in contact with a cell, it penetrates the cell. It has these little things that stick like arrows. They don't shoot it, but it sticks and penetrates and injects DNA into, the, into our cell to cause our cell to reproduce more viral cells. Not, I don't even know if they're cells, but more viral, viral DNA, RNA, and all that stuff. And so our cells start working for the enemy. No, we should not be working for the enemy. We should be working for the Lord. So he says, putting on the breastplate of faith. We need <clears throat> the breastplate of faith. I know that elsewhere it says the shield of faith, but right now I'm talking about the breastplate. That there is faith in our hearts. That our hearts are filled to overflowing with faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The more we're preaching, speaking, praying, reading, meditating on the word of God, the stronger our faith will be. This whole virus thing has caused my faith to soar. I've got stronger faith now than I had back in the beginning of March. I'm extending and using my faith for others every day. And it's growing stronger and stronger. Then he says, and love. Well, faith works by love. Faith works by love. You've got to have the love of God. Because the love of God is what causes our faith to be operational and powerful. God so loved the world he gave. And when we are giving of ourselves in prayer, in serving... That's when the love of God is so real to us <clears throat> and operational in our lives. And for the helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, salvation, as you know, sozo means to be made whole, to be rescued, to be set free, spirit, soul, and body. So the hope of salvation means that we are not hopeless cases. We are not hopeless. We have hope. It's the hope of our salvation, that what Jesus did for us we access in every area of our bodies. We access it through prayer, we access it through faith, and we access it through the words of our mouth. <clears throat> and so through these areas, we are able to stand against the devil. Now we have more. So go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 
putting all these together to work them together and use them. I'm going to do this message without going to spiritual warfare and uh, Ephesians 6 at all. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourselves. We start there. We don't know it all. We don't act like we know it all. We are not the experts. We humble ourselves. Humble ourselves in the sight of God. Even though we don't have all the answers, what we do know, we act upon. That's the key. We know far more spiritually than about 90% of the population of our country. So act on what we know. Because if you listen to the experts, they are trying their best to figure out what to do. But they really don't have a clue. Because what the experts were saying in March, they were saying the opposite in April. They're just trying their best. We have truth. And truth sets us and others free. It's God's word, which is true. If we use that, speak that, pray that, believe that truth, we will humble ourselves, not trying to be experts in the world, but experts in our faith. And others will come into the kingdom. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It is time for some of you to be exalted. I believe that with all my heart. God is exalting people this year, right now. Exalting people. Casting all your cares upon him. Stop carrying around all those cares. You know, oh man, there are so many people carrying around so many, and believers carrying around so many cares. I mean, they are weighted down with all the cares and all the trials and all the problems and all the fears and all the concerns. It's time to let God be God. You're not God. Let him be God. Cast those cares on him. How do you know you've cast your cares on him? You stop worrying about them. They may still be a, con a concern, but you're not worrying. You're praying. Cast those cares on the Lord. He cares for us. Be sober. There it is again. Same word. Be sober. Be observant. Be watchful. Be vigilant. Be attentive. Be heeding or heedful. I don't think heedful is a word. I wrote heedful down. I don't think that's a word. Is that a word? Uh, I, I go to my dictionary. Be heedful. If not, there's a good one for you. Be heedful. That means to heed. To heed something, okay? Full of heed. <laughs> what is it? Take heed. Yes, take heed. Uh, take heed's two words. Heedful is better. It's one word. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about, seeking whom he may devour. Any of you feel like lunch today? I mean, like not having lunch, like his lunch today? He's looking for lunch. He's going through the heavenly drive through And he pulls up to the screen, and he's ordering. Yeah, I'll have, uh, I'll have, I'll have one of John, and I'll have uh, a little bit of Mary. And uh, yeah, I, I'll have, I'll have, yeah, I'll have some of, I'll have some of her and some of him. He has a big appetite. He orders a big lunch. Then he pulls up to pay, and he expects he's going to get a bag full of people. But the Word of God says, "Be vigilant, because we know he's going through the drive-through looking for us. We know he's." as a roaring lion. Now notice the word of God does not say he is a roaring lion. He's pretending to be a roaring lion. He is acting like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. Greater is he that's in us than this roaring lion. But he's seeking whom he may devour. So what does the word of God say in verse 9? Resist steadfast in faith. All right, let's talk about that. To resist steadfast in faith is not always wielding the sword of the Spirit. To resist steadfast in the faith means the shield quenches what he says. It doesn't penetrate. He says you're never going to do it. That never reaches your mind. You don't even think. You don't even think you can't. You don't even think it won't happen. You don't even think you're not strong enough. You don't even think 
you're not going to have enough. The shield of faith catches all those darts. They don't even come into your mind or your heart. Because what are we thinking? I can do all things through Jesus Christ. He's the Lord my God, my healer. No harm will come near me. I'm abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. I'm a giver, and therefore it's given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. My needs are supplied according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Whatsoever I ask in Jesus' name, I receive that my joy may be made full. I'm not going to walk out around in heaviness and depression because I have the joy of the Lord that sets me free. The shield of faith stops those things before they penetrate our minds and our hearts. So we're not going to entertain those thoughts of depression, loss, those thoughts of failure, those thoughts of insignificance. We're not going to let those things come. The enemy wants you to think you're not significant. The enemy wants you to think you are not significant to anybody, anyone, nor the kingdom of God, nor the church, but you are significant, valuable, strong, and mighty in the Lord. Every one of us. There may be somebody that's watching or attending right now that feels pitiful and helpless. You are not. You have the authority in the name of Jesus. Rise up on the inside. Rise up on the inside and begin to call the outcome. Begin to say it like you want it to happen in Jesus' name. Begin to extend your faith for a mighty miracle of God in your life. Command the symptoms to cease. Command the disease to leave. Command the organs to be whole and, 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 and moving once again, strong, operating and functioning in the name of the Lord. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resists steadfast in the faith. Resists steadfast. In other words, there may be a counterattack. And just because you resisted once and there's a second attack, you don't give up because you failed. An attack does not mean a failure. It just means another attack. A war is not always won with one battle. Battle out here, let me, let me share an historical example. You all know who Hannibal is. And I'm not talking about Hannibal Lecter from the movie in the book. Hannibal. From Carthage. He decides to attack Rome. The reason Rome and, and, and Carthage were at war is because they were both becoming super um, economic powers and they wanted to control the Mediterranean Sea. So Hannibal takes an army, crosses the Alps, you know all about it with the elephants and everything, and attacks. Well, he was a strategic genius and he lures a Roman army of 40,000 people, 40,000 guys, into a trap. It wipes them out wipes them out. Well, that was a pretty big army for Rome at that time because this was like in the second century BC. So Rome quickly musters another army. This one's about 40,000 again. And about a year later, they meet in another part of the country and he wipes them out, lures them into another trap, different kind of trap, wipes them out. That happened three times, three times. It, it happened so many men died in these three battles that one out of every four military age men in Rome was dead. 25% of the male population had died. But the war was not over. And Hannibal was regrouping and refitting his army when Rome raised another army. Now, this guy was, Scipio was the name of the, the commanding general. He says, you know, we tried three times and we, that's not the way to do it. I'm going to put my army on boats and we're going to attack his town. So they go to Carthage and they attack. And so, sure enough, Carthage sends word for Hannibal to come home to defend the city. And that's the only thing that got him out of Italy. And eventually Hannibal lost one major battle, second major battle, third major battle, 25% of eligible men of military age dead. The people of Rome were sure Hannibal was going to invade the city at any moment. It didn't happen. Just because those battles were won by Hannibal, he lost the war and Rome became the superpower 
and Carthage was destroyed. Just because you may lose a skirmish or a battle against the enemy, rise up and stand on the word of God. The war is not over. And God has already declared us the winners, more than conquerors, triumphing in all things. That's health, finances, prayer requests, whatever it may be, we triumph through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So he says, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Resist. Resist. Res don't resist a political this or resist the enemy in the name of Jesus. Take the sword of the Spirit then. Speak the word of God in prayer. Speak the word of God to your body. Speak the word of God to your finances. Speak the word of God to the virus. Speak the word of God to our nation. Speak the word of God to the nations of the world. Pray it. Say it. Believe it. Live it. Act upon it. We're battling an unseen enemy. We're battling an invisible enemy. However, God's given us the victory. He's given us the ability. You know, <clears throat> warfare has changed so much from the days of the Romans. Even from the days of my father, who was uh, a combatant in World War II. Still pretty much in World War II. It was changing in World War II, but you still basically, you could see the enemy in a lot of the battles. Tank against tank, people against people. But rocket and long-range artillery was, was really starting to come in. <clears throat> Today, you hardly ever see the enemy. It's all computer-directed, drone-directed. You hardly ever person see another person or tank another tank. It's so long-range now. So even if you don't see the enemy, doesn't mean we don't have smart weapons to destroy the enemy and the effects of the enemy in our life. Stop using the dumb weapons. <clears throat> Start using the smart weapons of God. <clears throat> <clears throat> and you'll triumph in every situation and every circumstance. We battle the unseen enemy. We battle the invisible enemy. Yes, through those ways, we wash our hands. Clean hands and a pure heart. We sanitize surfaces. We distance. Stay away. If we have to stay away from each other, we should be staying away from sin. Stay away from the things of sin. Sanitize the air, prince of the power of the air. Apply those, and we will always win and not be taken down by the enemy in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.